the topic for today and the topic for me for a while now is going to be uh, the topic of rest. To me, uh, it's it's not just applicable to everybody, but it seems to be what continues to be um, coming up in almost every conversation that I have with anybody and everybody is rest. Um, I mean, practically speaking, I mean, just kind of on a, the funny side, it comes up, I think, every morning with Ronnie and I, now that she has this really new, cool GPS, uh, not GPS, Garmin, wa not what is it? Fitbit, thank you. I don't have one. She has a Fitbit, so it tracks how well or how, yeah, how well she sleeps or not uh, on any given night. And my wife... I, it's kind of a different flavor with her. She loves to sleep. Um, I mean, sleep is okay. I, I sleep a little bit, but not a whole lot. But she, she loves to sleep, and she is now focused on getting, hopefully getting eight hours or more every night. So it's a, it's a topic of discussion. Every morning, hey, how, how much sleep did you get? Oh, and usually it's not me bringing up. She's um, either telling me in kind of a, disappointed way, you know, what, what the night was like for her, according to her watch, um, or not. So they're, just from the practical perspective, uh, the need for rest is important. I mean, the Brewer family, like most of you, we have a frantic pace of life, uh, so rest is important. Um, but I'm understanding more and more that it isn't just important on the, on the physical, just merely physically. I'm seeing how important rest is from a spiritual perspective. So uh, I just want to give, a, a, a just hopefully it's a simple, and, and you can tell me if it's an easily understood sermon this, this morning, regarding what the Bible says about rest. Because I'm amazed to see that this is another one. I, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that the Bible probably is never ending in this way, in which it seems like, gosh, I, I, you know, you, you can go through a particular book or even a, a chapter and you think you, you have a pretty good understanding of it. And then sometime later, you see something else, and, and, and it's just amazing to think, I, I didn't see that before. And, and I, don't rec I didn't recognize the, the importance of it or the, the impact of it. Well, rest is, is one of those themes in the Bible that I don't think I saw before. And uh, I want to show you this morning how important rest is. Now, not rest as, it, uh, you know, how you're able to sit on the couch with a dog in your lap uh, and, and what that kind of rest is for you. I'm talking about the, the Bible's perspective of rest. So I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 30. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 30. And I'm going to start by, and, and I would ask you to resist uh, reading in and around where I'm at. Just try to follow me uh, as we go, because I know how you people are. Because I do the same thing, okay? I, I like to read, and um, something sparks my interest, and, and just try to just follow me, okay? So Isaiah chapter 30, and I want to draw your attention to verse 15. Isaiah writes this, for thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, some of your, your translations will say repentance, in returning or repentance and rest, you shall be saved. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. So in returning or repentance and rest, you will be saved. So it's interesting here. Returning and rest. So in this chapter, you know, most of you are familiar with somewhat who Isaiah is. He's a, he's a prophet. He was a prophet specifically to the nation of Judah. Uh, and he's explaining to these people the truth regarding their situation, again, as seen from God's perspective. Okay? And at this particular time, the, God's people, uh, they're lost, they're rebellious, uh, the, the nation of Israel is split into two. Judah is in their portion. Israel is in another. So you've got this split, this chasm that's going on. Conflict is, is rampant. Uh, 
uh, the the Babylonian and the Persian Empire thing is is going on here in a little bit. That's part of the prophecy of of Isaiah as far as what what God is going to do through pagan people uh, for not just two but for His people. So there's a, there's a whole lot going on uh, in in this book, both historically and in the context. We're going to look at, at specifically Isaiah chapter 30 uh, in in more detail. Um, there's a lot going on. Isaiah is calling God's people to repentance. He's, he's telling them what is going on specifically to them, like uh, in their rebellion, and he is giving God's perspective on things. I mean, that's what the Bible does. It gives God's perspective. How is God seeing? What, what is reality according to God, which ironically is the only reality, right? So God's reality is reality, and that's what's being declared through the prophet Isaiah. So look at, look at verse 8, and I'm going to re- go ahead and read um, from 8 to 14. So chapter 30, verse 8. It says, And now go, write it before them on a tablet, and, ins- and inscribe it in a book, that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. Verse 9, For they are a rebellious people. Lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, and that he's talking about the children who are rebellious, God's people, that they say to seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy illusions, leave the way, turn aside from the path, let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, thus says the Lord, uh, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach in a high wall, bulging out and about to collapse, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. And its breaking is like that of a potter's vessel that is smashed so ruthlessly. So there's something really interesting here. I want to draw your attention to verse 12. It says, uh, in verse 12, it says, Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, he's pointing back to what he just said. And what he just said in, in, in verses 8 through 11 is this dynamic that hey, these people are rebellious people. Uh, and not only are they rebellious, or in describing their rebellion, he talks about, hey, th- they, they are... Um, they are telling the people that are there to tell them the truth about their situation, hey, don't tell us that stuff anymore. We don't even want to hear the truth anymore. And in highlighting this, he says, because you despise this word, and, he, and listen, he says, and trust in, and I thought this was strange, trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them. Isn't that interesting? In light of Israel's history of being slaves in Egypt. This idea of oppression, uh, oppression and perverseness. Th- this isn't, I don't, I mean, at least for me as a human, I look at those two words as kind of, those are yucky, those are bad words. Those are negative words that I would never consider that, um, that I, would, I would ever think of rel- relying on oppression and perverseness. How, how does a person rely on oppression? Yeah, that seems contrary to what every human really uh, desires. I mean, I, every human kind of desires freedom, their own personal freedom, but yet God says, hey, you people are relying on oppression and perverseness. You trust in them. You despise my word. You despise the truth, and you trust in oppression and perverseness. I thought this was strange. Well, listen to the, to the definition of both of these words. Oppression means extortion or you know think of that word extortion it's it's a thing deceitfully gotten uh, a, a simple uh, definition beyond that is unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power and I'll, I'll explain that more in just a minute but I'm, I'll say it again unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power perverseness Oftentimes you think of perversion or perverted. We think of, you know, kind of negative, ugly, sin type things. But perverseness actually means this. It actually means simply to turn aside, 
or to, to depart. To turn away from is what is right or good, and listen to this, contrary to the evidence or direction of the judge on a point of law. So perverseness is a turning away from what is right, even though evidence points you to the fact that that's right. It's a departing of what is appropriate or what is true. A couple other phrases is obstinate in opposing what is right, reasonable, or accepted. Psalm 62, chapter, or chapter 62, verse 10 says this. I mean, this isn't the only place that this is talked about, which is interesting again. Because it's not just some isolated incident that God is saying, hey, you guys are trusting in oppression and in perverseness. He says in Psalm chapter 62, put no trust in oppression. Some, of, some translations say extortion. And set no vain hopes in perverseness or robbery. Set not your heart on them. So this is interesting. Now listen to this. This is an interesting twist. Oppression and perverseness. How, how in the world does God see people as putting their trust in those two things? Especially when, we, when most often we think of oppression in terms of what one person does to another. You know, you, you oppress a certain people group or one person oppresses somebody else. But listen to this. With, with the simple definitions that we just saw, listen to, to it in this light. We, in our own perceived authority, attempt to acquire things in our own power apart from God. This, therefore, is an attempt to gain through deception and theft, which is an unjust exercise of authority. So everything we've been talking about regarding little kingdoms and you know little kings and little queens, that that's the reality of what's represented here in this congregation. Each individual here represents your own little fiefdom, kingdom or queendom, okay? So with that idea, and that's how we act, that's, that's really what God has allowed us to do. That's, that's our, in essence, our curse, that we get to decide what is good for me, and that ends up being in contradic contradiction to what is declared as good by God. And guess what that is? It's an unjust exercise of authority that is actually trying to rob or get something that isn't yours under your own power, which is extortion. So two different, really different ways of thinking about oppression and perverseness. Think of Adam and Eve. We've given this example over and over again. God declares what is good. He says, this is the truth from my perspective, which really is the only truth, and it's meant to be good for my creatures, Adam and Eve. But what did they do? God declares what is true and just, but then Adam and Eve and their kingdom and their queendom, they decide something different. And they then exercise unjust authority to gain what is not theirs, which ultimately is an attempt at robbery. The Israelites are the same way. And what we're seeing, what we do see here in Isaiah chapter 30, is a description of the same dynamic. The Israelites wanted help. They're under oppression in the normal sense that we understand oppression. And they wanted help. But guess what the Israelites are determining? They wanted help. They wanted to acquire help on their own terms. They didn't want the help that God continually, continuously promised to give them. Because that's what we see in Scripture all the time. God declare, he, he declares his promises to his people, all of which include help, his assistance, all of which declares the truth from God's perspective, but yet the people continuously do what? They turn away, they depart, and they look to get help on their own terms. Well, look, I, look back in Isaiah chapter 9. What was the help that God offered? Now, we're only in February, but we typically read this passage in Christmas, during Christmas time. So Isaiah chapter 9, the help that God offers is this. 
starting in verse 6, chapter 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. What does God promise his his people through the prophet Isaiah? He promises them something that they don't have right now. Something that they actually want, but in a very different way. He promises help. He promises peace. He promises rest. His people know that he is sovereign. I think we'd all agree with that, right? I mean, it's over and over again through the Psalms, through the Proverbs, through the history of Israel, through every one of the prophets. God declares that he's sovereign. He declares that he knows all things, that he he does all things. Those people have heard that over and over again. They know that. I mean, from an informational standpoint. They know that everything that they have is what God has given them based on his exercise of divine authority. But what do they still do instead? They insist on turning away from his truth, which that's the definition of perverseness. They turn away from that truth, and then they exercise their own authority, which is actually unjust authority, which is oppression. So you see how that's tied to their trusting in oppression and perverseness in their own exercise of authority in order to get something they think they don't have. Ill-gotten gain. Let's look at how this is illustrated in, in Isaiah chapter 30. So look at verse, verses 1. I'm going to read 1, 2, and then 7. So verse 1 in chapter 30 says, Ah, stubborn children, declares the Lord, who carry out a plan but not mine, who make an alliance but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who set out to go down to Egypt without asking for my direction, to take refuge in the protection of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Now look at verse 7. So now we see that God is saying, hey, these people, they're wanting help on their own accord. They're wanting to acquire help according to the good that they think, which is contrary to what I've already said that I would give them. And look at verse 7. And and this help they think they're going to get in a different king. God promises his kingship God promises his uh, his divine power and authority through the ultimate Messiah. And they they instead decide that, hey, I want to go to this other king. We don't want that king. Look at verse 7. God says, Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her Rahab who sits still. That's a reference to another passage. Um, And another passage that talks about how Egypt acts as though it's like they're a, they're a big dragon or a big, a big crocodile who sits in the river and doesn't do anything. So they look like they can provide assistance. They look like they're strong and powerful according to human standards, but actually they don't do anything. They just sit there and they're useless. And that's what God highlights here. Egypt's help is worthless and empty. So here are my people who I have promised to give them help and assistance as their sovereign king, they're looking to a different sovereign king. They're exercising their own unjust authority to decide in something else to get help from, which is no help. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, and, and these same people who are seeking this help that is no help, they say to seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. So to the people who are telling them the truth about God and their situation, the people that are telling them reality according to God's perspective, these people that are telling them that God knows what he's doing, that he promises them a real sovereign king who holds everything under his, his power, God's people say to those people that are declaring truth, hey, don't tell us anymore these messages about what is right and true. That's that idea of, again, oppression and perverseness. Despite the evidence that the appropriate judge is declaring, they're saying, nope, we're going to depart from that. 
we don't want that. And I'm now going to exercise my own power and authority to get what I think I don't have. Unjust exercise of power and authority, contrary to the evidence. Oppression and perverseness. So how does this play out in real life? This might seem kind of, I don't know, philosophical, theological to you right now, but God now shows us what the Israelites do. So how does it play out in real life? And then how does it relate to rest? God promises life, freedom, hope, and peace. We, we saw that with the verse that we started with in verse 15. He says, for thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. So God promises them life, freedom, hope, and peace. He promises them salvation. He tells them, like we covered in, in uh, Sunday school this morning, in Psalm 46, verse 10, to be still and know that I am God. I mean, this has been the message all through the history of Israel. The prophets continually point back. The, the, the theme and message of what happened in the Exodus and what happened with Egypt is the constant story and illustration that God holds out for his people over and over and over again. The Israelites constantly are pointing back. Moses did it right after the Exodus was finished, and then every prophet afterward is constantly pointing back to what God did in the Exodus and the dynamic of the hearts of the people during the Exodus. And, the, and the, the message there that God is consistently pointing to is, hey, be still and know that I'm God. Look at what I did before. Look what I promised before. I fulfilled my, my promises to you. It was, that All of that was meant as good for you, and it was good. And you know what? You can, you can be still. This, this idea of quietness, this idea of rest. You can rest in me that I know what I'm doing, and I'm going to fulfill what I promise to you. But look at what the Israelites do. Look at verse 16. So right after, in verse 16, uh, chapter 30, right after Isaiah writes and, and declares to them, in returning and in rest you shall be saved, it says in verse 16, and you said, no, we will flee upon horses and therefore you shall flee away. And, we will ride upon swift steeds, therefore your pursuers shall be swift. Again, reminding them of what happened during the Exodus. What was the dynamic? I, we talked about this a year and a half ago in my last sermon on rest. And the dynamic of the Exodus is that God delivers the Israelites. They're, they're in, literally in the process of being delivered. They're out of, almost out of the confines of their slavery and captivity in Egypt. And in time and space, they're experiencing this mix of emotion of, of I think, elation and exuberance. And what do they see when they look behind them? The army of Pharaoh. The Egyptian army bearing down on them. And like we talked about in Sunday school, the human reaction is to what? Fight or flight. I got to get on my horse and get out of here. Because what I thought was happening and what God had promised me, that what God said was happening, what God said is happening right now, from my human perspective, what is the perspective? Somebody want to answer it? It's not happening. It's not true. God's wrong. This is crazy. And I've got to do something. I think that's interesting. No, we will flee on horses, so you will flee indeed. Flee, this idea of flee means to escape. It means to run away from danger. You know what else it means? It means to hide. I mean, both of those concepts. Again, to think about oppression and perverseness, and what, what I described as the, the uh, definition of those two things, this idea of escaping and fleeing, when God says, be still and know that I'm God, or to return and rest, 
So the human idea of, okay, no, that can't be right. I need to get on my horse and flee is actually an unjust exercise of power and authority. Contrary to the evidence. Now, whose evidence? God's evidence. Because I'm thinking the evidence is what? Through my own human eyes. I'm determining what evidence is evidence. I'm determining what true what piece of evidence is truth, which ends up being in contradiction to what? To reality, which is God's perspective. So this idea of fleeing, escaping, or hiding is an unjust exercise of power and authority, which is contrary to the evidence, in order to acquire something that God already said he was going to give them. Allegedly fleeing to refuge, but instead, instead they're fleeing from refuge. They're fleeing to something that God has already said. Hey, you think that's help, and it's not help. There's no refuge there. So guess what the result is? Now that's a practical illustration as far as this idea that God promises salvation or rest. He tells them that, I mean, he's declared over and over again the reality that, hey, I'm God, I'm your king, I know what I'm doing, and you can rest in what I'm doing. And so we see this practical illustration that they say, no, no, no way. My eyes are telling me something different. I'm going to get on my horse and I'm going to go to where I believe the refuge is. That's the kind of practical illustration if we were to see that on a picture, you know, uh, Israelites or God's people on horses just riding away. But what's the result? What's the, what's the internal, what's happening internally with, with, with those people? What's the dynamic that's being described here internally for everybody? There's no rest. It's constant toil. It's constant struggle. It's constant work. It's interesting that, that uh, God says there, so he, he says, I, basically the words of the people, no, we're going to flee on our horses. And he says, therefore you will flee away. And he says, and your pursuers will be swift. You're never going to get away from your pursuers. So not only is the help that you think is help not help, but your attempt to, to flee away from the danger, you're never going to get away. So what's the dynamic? We talked about it in Sunday school. The dynamic is this spinning wheel, this constant toil. Me trying to exercise my unjust authority to get to refuge that isn't refuge. When I never get to refuge, what do I constantly pursue? Refuge. Listen to Job chapter 3, verses 25 through 26. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. I think this illustrates that, in, uh, this, that internal struggle. The internal struggle, the toil, the work of the human heart that's trying to exercise authority to gain something for themselves that can only be given by God himself. I'm going to give you two quotes. Listen to these quotes. This first quote is, um, is from Thomas Jefferson. It says, There are indeed gloomy and hypochondriac minds, it ha inhabitants of diseased bodies disgusted with the present and despairing of the future, always counting that the worst will happen, because it may happen. To these I say, how much pain have cost us the evils that have never happened. I'll give you another quote by Mark Twain here in just a second. I'm going to read that again because I hope you can catch the dynamic. This is the dynamic of that internal struggle of us, we individuals who are caught in this fleeing, this, this trusting oppression and perverseness, uh, trusting this idea that, that I'm, I can exercising my own 
perceived power and authority to go and get something that God has already promised me that I can never get on my own. It says, there are indeed those who might say, nay, gloomy and hypochondriac minds, inhabitants of diseased bodies, disgusted with the present and despairing of the future, always counting that the worst will happen because it may happen. To these I say, how much pain have cost us the evils which have never happened. You know what I'm convinced of? Probably, I, I mean, I, I say this, I, I throw a number out there, but I don't know, 70% of what I think about never takes place. Much of that which I toil about in my brain and in my heart, much of the angst that I have, the fears that I have, the depression, the anger, whatever, the, the fruits of a frustrated sovereign that we so talk about all the time, the impatience, the stuff that I toil with inside, the things that I'm fleeing from, never happen. But they might. So they're important, right? Listen to what Mark, Mark Twain says. I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened. The Bible ex explains or describes the same dynamic. Psalm chapter 55, verses 1 through 2, and it says it in verse 4 and 5. To just give one little part of that, it says, I am restless in my complaint and I moan. So what does God offer us? Here's where we come back to the rest part. How does rest apply here? Again, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. He says, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. Do you understand the returning piece now? Repentance is a big word that most of us have an idea of what it means, but this idea of returning, especially when afterwards he just talked about, hey, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to get on your horse and you're going to flee. You're going you're to go away from me in an attempt to find refuge. But you know what I'm telling you? In returning and in rest, there is salvation. He, he ties rest and repentance or returning to salvation. That's the simplicity of salvation. When I recognize that this is a never-ending toil, I'm in, a, I'm in a loop in this human existence apart from Christ. I'm in this never-ending loop until God interrupts it and shows me that I can't get what I think that I'm trying to get. I can't find help in anything else be, help because there's not help there. Until I return. And I come back, and the concept that we talked about in Sunday school, and, and, and I yield. I, this idea of yielding, not just in the sense of a fight or a wrestling match to where somebody's stronger than, than me, and I know that I can't do this anymore, or I can't, I can't triumph over this person, so I yield, I give up. I think that the idea of yielding to God is, is in a sense, almost a different positive sense, and that, hey, you know what, I... I'm tired of trying to be the sovereign in my life, and I yield to the real sovereign who I can recognize really does want good for me. In returning and rest, you shall be saved. And listen to the rest of it. It says, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Totally different strength. That's what the Bible is talking about all the time. Totally different strength than what humans think is strength. Humans think, especially then, horses, chariots, swords, right arm, strong arm. Those words are constantly uh, repeated in, in the Hebrew, illustrating what humans think is strength. And now God says, guess what strength? Guess what strength is for you, my people? Being still being quiet, resting in me. And you start to see that concept, and you really start to see that repeated through Scripture. You see words, especially in the Hebrew, that words that are related, all, kind of all in the same loop there as it pertains to rest, is hope, weight, stillness, quietness, 
All of that is with this idea of being able to sit and be quiet, being able to be still and believe that God indeed knows what he's doing and that my rest and my hope, my refuge is found in him alone. This is why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. Do you know where that weariness and heavy laden comes from? The dynamic that we just explained in Isaiah chapter 30. I'm going to get, I've got to get on my horse and get away from that right there. I've got to escape. I've got to flee. Exercising my unjust authority to think that I can get help there when God has already promised me help. And now I'm in this constant state of toiling, fight or flight. You see how secular psychology explains it perfect? Fight or flight is a constant state of working and weariness. I use the example often about seeing a deer in the woods. Every little noise is an alarm to that deer. And they are ready to flee on a second's notice. That's what it's like in this world. That's, like, that's what it's like here for us creatures in, here in this world. And Jesus says, you know what? Come to me, all who, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For those of you that find yourself weary, tired, weary and restless because of the endless conversations in your head in which you are trying to figure out how to flee or how to fight, how to escape, how to find refuge, how to get peace, how to get back hope of some kind, attempting to exercise your own authority and power in order to gain something that God has promised. Jesus, the real king, says, you know what? You can stop fleeing. You can stop fleeing in order to find help on your own terms because there is no help there. Return. Come back and rest. Be still and know that protection, refuge, salvation can only be found in me. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 25 says this, For I satisfy the weary ones and refresh everyone who languishes. This is way more than just being physically tired. This is that spiritual struggle, the emotional struggle, the, uh, the toiling that is never-ending in the human heart that God says, you know what, I've come to rescue you from you. In returning in repentance and rest, you shall be saved in quietness and trust shall be your strength. If you look at the end of the chapter there, in verse 18, listen how he ends that little segment. God says this, Therefore the Lord waits. There's another one of those words. Just like rest, just like being still, just like being quiet. It's interesting how uh, in Hebrew there's these plays on words, and you see this play right here. It says, Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. So this is his action. God, he's saying to his people who are fleeing on their horses at that point, point in time, both kind of literally and figuratively, he says, you know what? I'm, I'm going to wait to be gracious to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. It says, for the Lord is a God of justice. And then he says, here's this play on, on the, that Hebrew word to wait. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So God is waiting for his people to return and to rest, to find salvation and refuge in him. He says, I'm waiting to be gracious to you. Then he says, blessed are all those who wait for him. And that's that same concept of resting of just being able to be still and being quiet, being able to yield, knowing 
that God knows what he's doing and that everything that God is doing is for our good and his glory. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, I thank you for this day, Lord, and I pray that uh, just for everybody here, every adult, every kid, every small child, every teenager, Lord, that you would give them the, the ability to be able to return, to be able to, to, to be able to recognize this dynamic, Lord, that's going on in the human heart, this constant state of working and toiling, and that it is a result of wanting to find refuge, wanting to find protection, wanting to find peace, that that desire and that activity of looking for our own help, God, is actually trusting oppression and trusting perverseness, that it's our own exercise, it's our own unjust exercise of my perceived authority. Lord, help us to recognize that dyna dynamic in our own heart. Help us to recognize that today, this week, as we wrestle with ourselves and with other people. And as you help us to recognize that, Lord, help us to remember your words in Psalm 46, that we can be still and know that you are God. Help us to remember these words in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, that, Lord, in rest or in repentance and rest, there is salvation. That, God, we can turn to you. We can be quiet. We can be interrupted of our own thoughts, Lord, and we can rest in the fact that you are our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of danger and in struggle. And as a result, Lord, give each person here comfort and a peace that passes understanding. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you wait for us to return to you. And that waiting is just another example of your mercy and grace to us. I thank you for your love and for your grace. And in Jesus' name I pray, all God's children said, amen.